Hi, uh, my name is Catherine Turner. I'm a psychiatrist and executive director of Metro North Mental Health, uh, a large mental health and drug and alcohol service in Brisbane, Queensland, Australia. And I'm going to be talking about our journey to embed a restorative just and learning culture, uh, which is about a healing process, learning and improving. So um, first of all, I'd like to respectfully acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which we live uh, and walk, work and walk, and pay respects to all elders past, present and emerging. And I'd also like to recognise the lived and living experience of people with mental illness, problematic alcohol and other drug use, as well as those impacted by suicide and trauma, their families, carers and support people. We respect and value their opinions and input into service delivery and change. And I'm going to be talking a bit about the drivers of change um, what is a restorative just and learning culture and particularly focus on uh, staff support and consumer family and carer engagement and support and I'll touch on some of the learnings from all of this. So uh, the work that we did uh, started on the Gold Coast um, back in about 2016, 2015, 2016. It's Gold Coast is a city of a population of about 660,000 and then more recently, um, over the last couple of years, I moved to Metro North Mental Health, which is uh, a large um, service in Brisbane, uh, Australia. And um, it's a large drug and alcohol and, um, and mental health service that covers about a million population and significant statewide services as well. So um, our work really started, as I said, back in about 2015, when we realised that we really needed to do something differently in terms of suicide prevention. Um, we needed to, you know, really change the paradigm uh, that we were working within because there was a lack of progress. There was a strong sort of focus on a risk prediction approach, which we know is not uh, effective. And there was a general pessimism about the ability to prevent suicides. And um, so we discovered the zero suicide framework and thought that that was a great framework, um, a systems approach to suicide prevention. But um, we were a bit concerned about um, the zero word and whether that would worsen a culture of blame. There was already con concerns about a culture of blame and limited learning when there were suicides um, because there were quite linear approaches to learning in our complex systems, um, processes that are highly influenced by hindsight and outcome bias. And often, you know, the outcomes of the reviews um, weren't particularly effective. There were poor recommendations, weak recommendations, and there was really a lack of consistent support for staff following incidents. We know that our responses to harm can compound harm. So the impact of the loss of someone to suicide can be significant. But then uh, the way that we approach it and the way that we respond to that uh, and adverse incidents often um, fails to address the human impacts and leads to further harm to consumers, carers, families, staff and the organisation. And Joe Whaling and group um, sort of have articulated this really well and, and talked about compounded harm arises when those human considerations are not attended to, um, which results in shame, contempt, betrayal, disempowerment, abandonment or unjustified blame, which can intensify over time. So when we started at the Gold Coast, we looked at, um, we really wanted to understand uh, the, the experience of staff uh, following a, a suicide and um, had a lot of focus groups across the service. And, and the staff gave a lot of information um, right across the sort of the, the response spectrum. So in the immediate response, they reported that they really want a much more standardised approach. They wanted to have a debriefing after the um, incident and they wanted to be upskilled and be supported in engaging with families and carers following uh, the loss of a patient to suicide. The staff wanted to be involved in the process. They wanted to um, stop the, the assumption of blame or error and, um, and bias as part of that. And they wanted the whole team to be involved in the review and to learn as part of that process. They also wanted to look at what went well as well as part of that process. Um, they wanted to be heard, feel safe and not to be judged negatively. And they wanted transparency and um, they also wanted to close the loop. They wanted to hear what the results were and also share learnings across the service. And that led to a whole range of recommendations um, that we implemented within the service. And um, what we eventually discovered was that uh, a lot of that was very closely aligned with uh, restorative just and learning culture. 
uh, and we created um, a framework to, to implement that. So what is restorative just in learning culture? Um, well, you know, there were some of the drivers for it is that we really need to try and work out how we incorporate our understanding of complexity into our reviews of incidents and how we move away from cultures of blame and how we prevent compounded harm. And, um, you know, an interesting writer, Virginia Sharp, she's an ethicist from Washington, D.C., and she wrote an essay in response to the Institute of Medicine's report to Err is Human, and that really talked about moving away from cultures of blame uh, to more systems approaches. And Virginia Sharp said that um, it, we do need to accept that the cause of error is more correctly attributed to the complexity of systems rather than failures of individuals. So we need to stop blaming individuals. And we really need to understand the weaknesses in our systems and the interactions between factors such as humans and their environment. However, there's an, it, it really was quite a narrow consideration of accountability and it was solely focused on institutional rather than individual accountability. So there was a risk that people could say, well, don't blame me. It was a systems problem and sort of step out of the whole process. Um, and also victims were powerless in this, in, in our usual retributive cultures, um, which is sort of the, the culture that we have currently, um, there is uh, an opportunity for victims to seek retribution through that process. However, if you're, if you're calling something a no-blame culture, uh, there, there was no um, role for victims in that. So Virginia Sharp said we really need different ways of approaching um, uh, this accountability issue. So we need to, new structures to account for and be accountable for what we now know to be the occurrence of error in complex systems and she talked about a forward-looking accountability rather than that retributive backward-looking accountability, and that more adequately addresses the tensions between the system and the individual accountability and the empowerment of victims. So a forward-looking accountability really brings everyone together. It orients everyone who has an effect on patient care towards safety improvement, which includes clinicians, but also administrators, boards, technicians, IT, etc. And it includes the healing of relationships and people openness, analysis of incidents to understand causes and implement improvements. So, um, so I guess there's, there's many strands, I think, to restorative just and learning culture, but at the core, core of it is moving away from, you know, questions of, well, who did, who did something, you know, what happened, who, who did it, you know, um, how bad was that uh, breach or error and what do we need to do about them to questions, restorative questions, which is focusing on who is hurt and what are their needs, who's responsible for meeting those needs, how can relationships be repaired, and how can we mitigate the risk of harm in the future? So always coming back to those questions, and it includes a healing process, a learning process, an improvement process, and engagement of all stakeholders and respect for all. So healing can be both for the families, the consumers, carers and families, such as, you know, through clinician disclosure and support, postvention support for those families um, but all, and open disclosure, but also how we heal um, staff uh, and how we respond and support staff following that. The learning is about engaging all of those who have been impacted in a restorative review process that includes consumers, carers, families and staff and the leadership and how we look at embed complexity in our understanding of incident reviews and how we also produce good high quality strength and recommendations um, and we share lessons. So um, trying to describe restorative just and learning culture has been a challenging issue and, and uh, people are still grappling with what it actually means. And um, so we've a, a number of colleagues, so Nick O'Connor and Joe Whaling and myself have sort of come up with this, it's more of a description than a definition, I guess, and I will take um, take people through this now because I think it's useful to pull all of the strands together. So a restorative just and learning culture is a development in safety culture thinking, and it addresses the importance of people, relationships and trust and applies a complex, complex adaptive system approach to system improvement. It's a voluntary relational process where all of those affected by an adverse event come together in a safe and supportive environment with the help of skilled facilitators to speak openly about what happened, to understand the human impacts, and to clarify responsibility for the actions required for healing and learning. A restorative approach emphasises the central role of interconnectedness through a web of relationships and the central importance of respect. 
It requires us to balance the perspectives and concerns for all parties and support the dignity of each person and restore it when it's been diminished. So restorative health organisations are guarded by the principles, values and practices and priorities of a restorative framework. So as well as handling conflicts, complaints and harm in a restorative manner, they develop policies and practices that recognise the needs of patients, families and staff as whole persons, exhibit a distributed style of leadership and inclusive decision making and proactively develop a culture of belonging and respect through the organisation. So it's about both a proactive and a, and a response. To emphasise the learning and improvement elements inherent in restorative just culture and so important for healthcare, we refer to a restorative just and learning culture, which is, merges a range of restorative approaches with a continually developing understanding of learning and improvement in our complex systems of care. It's a deeply accountable, forward-looking process that recognises that we work in complex adaptive systems and that we need new systems approaches to leading, learning and improving following harm. So, um, so I guess that's a description. Now, what? How did we go about it, and what were what were the, some of the things that we did, particularly around that um, support for staff and support for consumers, carers, and families? So, um, at the Gold Coast, we did a lot of focus groups looking at um, what was the experience of staff, and staff were deeply impacted um, by incidents in the past, sometimes many years in the past, that were very still very fresh and um, impactful on them now. And um, they described that support wasn't provided in a consistent way. It often was dependent on the person in charge. Sometimes, you know, response was great. Sometimes it wasn't. Sometimes it was uh, great and continued. Sometimes it might be great, you know, the first day and then people forget about them. So staff wanted a more consistent uh, approach and um, a, t a timely and reliable response um, to and following a traumatic event. And um, the staff said that they want to be part of that process. And overwhelmingly, staff said that they needed the person who responds to the incident to initially ask, are you OK and how can we help you? And not straight away say, well, what happened? Um, how did it happen? So it's a lot of messages for, for us as leaders in the organisation. So um, the staff developed um, what they call the always there framework. And that's a combination of um, particularly influenced by Scott's three tier model of peer support intervention for um, what was called the second victim. So that's terminology really for those people impacted, um, such as staff um, following an incident, We're tending to move away from that language of second victim now, but in, in just using the um, language of those impacted. It also inc included the GRACE model of. Um, uh, compassion, social resilience framework, uh, Denim's five rights of the second victim and psychological first aid. Um, and the trajectory of the stress response. So, you know, the interventions aimed to change that. So it's a it's a way forward away from what the current culture is, is often about invulnerability, isolation and shame towards a culture that values reflection and learning and promotes a shared organisational responsibility for clinician wellbeing and patient safety. So really moving away from sort of dropping out or just surviving to actually thriving following an incident. And this is the three tier model. So the, the third tier is really um, the sort of professional response. So the employee assistance or general practitioner, et cetera. Tier one is what, what's present um, through our service, uh, you know, within the team. So the, the line manager, your colleagues being able to, to respond and support people following an incident. And then tier two was the most significant change that we've made. And that was the volunteer staff uh, peer responders who um, were trained and um, when there was an incident, they would be sort of dispatched to um, go and spend time in the in the area with the team that's been impacted, uh, and and provide that psychological first aid, and then could follow up once or twice um, as well. So there was great um, engagement from the staff. Um, they really sort of invested a lot into this uh, and uh, promoted it. Wrote a song, a dance, and uh, really promoted it around the service. And it was really. Uh, well received and and taken up. So um, so really, our response framework. There was those two significant streams. There was the always there response, which I've talked about, and then there was how do we actually respond and learn from an incident. So and pulling all of these strands together, um, we created this matrix framework again because it was 
there are many parts to to a restorative just and learning culture and how um, we can understand how all of the parts fit together. We sort of created this this framework. So up at the top um, is that uh, that proactive element. So really setting the safety culture, building that respect and trust, learning systems improvement and resilient healthcare. And then it's um, the questions, the restorative questions on the side there, who was hurt and what are their needs, who's responsible for meeting those needs. So there's the consumer of care and family, there's the clinician and there's the service as well. And then how can harms and relationships be repaired and how can we mitigate the risk of harm in the future? So it's looking at that immediate response, um, how we engage everyone in that review process, the formal open disclosure, and how we implement and evaluate. And, um, you know, clinicians, for example, can have both needs and obligations in, in that. They have both the need for healing, but also that um, accountability to be part of a healing and a learning process. Um, so we created... Uh, sort of a guideline and um, some tools and really looked at, you know, quite practical tips on how to do this um, as part of that, um, you know, the family and care engagement, the staff wellbeing and how we review incidents. And um, I was just going to show a video now, which is uh, giving the consumer family perspective. We talk a lot about compassionate care. We talk a lot about showing compassion to families and and putting the needs of um, families and carers first. But um, when we make people wait and wait and wait and wait for, for reviews and when it's um, structured that way, rather than having people come in and be invited and, um, and to be offering support in an ongoing manner and also in an individualised way at where we're actually right from the start inviting them to tell us what you need, tell us how you're impacted. We really want to... Um, you know, support you and we want to learn together and your feedback about what's happened um, is is just as important as anything that we are, um, you know, working on or seeking to uncover or reviewing from from notes. What, what your experience has been matters just as much. That is a very different um, experience for families and carers rather than um, being shut out of what's happening, our service is not going to stop um, pursuing absolutely every way we can to continuously improve and do better and care for ourselves and them as we are all members of the community. And I think that's been one of the most um, powerful parts of the changes that we've made, that um, engagement of families um, and such uh, rich learnings that we've had from families as well. And it's also impacted clinicians in a really positive way. And, and this just gives a bit of an account from uh, a couple of clinicians about what their experience was with the old process and what a restorative just and learning culture was. So one experience talked about coming into the room, they were, um, they were reading the notes as if I wasn't even in the room. My heart was thumping. I didn't even know the process. It was very confronting. I felt that they were just looking through to see what I had done wrong so that they could point the finger that it was my fault. And then the more recent uh, experience, it was a way that a process more thoughtful and more honest. Everyone feels comfortable to talk about what actually really happened and where their thoughts and what their thoughts were without fear of retribution or fear of blame. You actually feel supported. And I think that's, um, you know, says a lot about it's not necessarily an easy process, um, but it's a much better process. And um, we evaluated this work on the Gold Coast. Um, we looked at both the experience of um, the experience of sort of staff and also uh, our outcomes of the reviews. And we did that through a number of staff surveys, but also um, sort of a review of what types of incidents we were reviewing, uh, the quality of those review processes and then the quality and strength of the recommendations that came out of it and we demonstrated that we were able to show significant improvements in stakeholder inclusion um, the experience of of staff and the quality and strength of recommendations in the incident responses so we get both a better outcome for for staff and better outcomes of the reviews um, anecdotally we had much better outcomes for families uh, but that uh, is something that we're keen to learn more from and measure in a more significant way. So just briefly on the reflections. So um, I think, you know, one of the reflections is that it's a real balance between 
thinking about what the processes are and uh, also what the concepts are that you know why are we doing this what's the purpose and then how can we actually do it if we just focus on you know why we do it and we don't have those processes um, you, you're not going to bring about culture change if you just focus on the processes all of those things that we put in place without the why you just have another sort of process driven um, uh, approach and again you won't change the culture so it's a very relational process uh, it's engagement of staff you know a co-design process with consumers their family carers staff and lots and lots of conversations across the service also um, it's worth sort of thinking about there's often um, often people say well we already do that we already engage with families we don't blame and yet there seems to be a significant disconnect between what we think we do as leaders and what the experience of staff are. We never think for a minute that we, we're setting out to blame, but often the experience is for, for, for staff um, that they feel blamed. And the same with, with families. We think that we engage families, but often the experience for families is different. And I think that there's a number of reasons for this. I think it is really challenging to move our, way, our thinking away away from linear approaches to thinking, to truly thinking about systems approaches, to truly thinking away from the individual to the system. And the result of this is that it results in unintended blame. We don't intend to blame, but that's the product of, of thinking in that way. So we really need to accept the challenges that we've had with this and, and the impacts that the past can have, um, you know, in the present, it can be enduring. We also sometimes think that you know, we, we want to in, engage families, but often we rationalise that, oh, well, it might be too upsetting for families to engage them or the family wasn't very involved or there were no family that we were aware of. And often the, those things are very um, wrong. And we actually, and it, it, sometimes it's a it's a, an indicator of sort of underlying anxiety or lack of confidence in being able to have those really challenging um, uh, conversations. And we really need to support staff both emotionally and through skills building to have those conversations. So other learnings, as I said, it's a constant conversation. It's a constant balance between a focus on principles and a focus on processes. The matrix framework that I uh, put up may assist people in trying to understand how all of the components fit together. Uh, we need to continue our efforts to develop a definition. I think that that would be helpful for communication. Um, our, the, the description that we've, we've shown there earlier um, is an evolving description. Uh, we do get better quality learnings and improvements and improved outcomes for consumers, carers, families and staff. There's often a real misunderstanding about accountability. Uh, people sometimes think that, you know, a restorative approach is somehow uh, just being nice to people, but it's actually a really deeply accountable process. You have to be very engaged and there's an element of vulnerability when you engage in this way. It's not an easy option, but it's a much, much better option. And we do know that cultural change is tenuous and aspects can quickly shift whether there's changes of leadership or uh, other changes in the system. So it's really a sort of a constant um, effort to implement this but it's certainly been a very rewarding um, experience and, and an ongoing uh, journey to implement a restorative just and learning culture. Thank you. Hi everyone my name is Corey Feist I'm the CEO and co-founder of the Dr. Warner Breen Heroes Foundation and I'm really excited to be with you today. The Dr. Lorna Breen Heroes Foundation was founded by the family of Dr. Lorna Breen who died by suicide in April of 2020. Lorna was the medical director of a very busy emergency room in Manhattan, was getting her MBA from Cornell and really living her life's dream to be a busy emergency medicine physician in New York City. Lorna was struck down by COVID and then tried to come back to the workforce too fast. And what she found was an overwhelming and relentless number of sick and dying patients that she felt incapable of taking care of, but instead of taking a break for herself, she pushed on and she pushed through until she actually became catatonic, needed to be hospitalized for her first and only mental health condition of her entire life. In the middle of that hospitalization, Lorna then began to articulate to us that she was concerned that by obtaining mental health treatment, this would cost her the career 
that she had always strived to achieve since she was a little girl. Lorna died by suicide on April 26, 2020, and the publicity around her death caused a tsunami of feedback to us as the family from healthcare professionals across the country saying enough is enough. We cannot let another physician die by suicide. We must change this environment so that the workforce can thrive. And because uh, both her sister, my wife, Jennifer, and I were both attorneys, and I was a healthcare attorney and then a healthcare CEO at the time, we felt like we could not ignore the volume of feedback that we received. And so we created the foundation in June of 2020, whose mission it is to be dedicated to reducing the burnout of healthcare professionals and safeguarding their professional well being and job satisfaction. We envision a world where seeking mental health services is universally viewed as a sign of strength for all of our healthcare professionals, not just our doctors. The way we view this issue at the Lorna Breen Foundation is at least in two buckets. And I say at least is because we've overly simplified it, but we've done that on this slide so that we can be very crisp with our language. The way we view well being is it has at least these two parts burnout, which is an occupational syndrome, not a mental health condition. And then we have discrete mental health conditions like depression, anxiety, and substance use disorders. When we think about how we attack these issues, we need to remember that because burnout is an occupational syndrome that is driven by the stressful work environment, we need to look at the underlying root causes of that stressful work environment, those systems changes that need to be addressed. We also need to hold pressure on this bleeding patient, the healthcare industry, by providing individual support so that the workers can continue on but we must not ever forget that in order to really address the source of the bleeding, we have got to change the system. We also need to support the mental health of our healthcare workers. One of the things that Lorna articulated to us as a reason that she took her own life was because she was concerned that she would lose her license to practice medicine because she'd obtained mental health treatment. Come to learn later that there are at least six barriers to mental health access that uniquely apply to licensed healthcare workers. We need to remove those barriers so that our healthcare healers can obtain the same mental health treatment that their patients have access to. We also have learned of great practices in training the healthcare workforce in suicide prevention. Those same practices can save lives by having workforce intervene with each other in the healthcare domain and save each other's lives. And we have many examples of where that's being done. And then we need we must ensure that healthcare professionals have confidential access to appropriate mental health care. Because of the stigma associated with obtaining mental health care and the real and perceived barriers to obtaining it and penalties for obtaining it, the confidentiality of the access is the most important thing on that list uh, once you once you knock out these barriers. When we think about this issue from the perspective of the data, look no further than the annual Medscape survey of physicians, which clearly just delineates the difference between burnout and depression and shows, however, that both are rising. So our foundation has been focusing on two operational goals, advancing solutions to improve the professional well-being of the healthcare workforce and eliminate persistent mental health and well-being challenges that disadvantage our health workers. We've done this through raising awareness in just this past year, over 450 articles. We've also published now 11 or 12 times. We've done about 187 keynote addresses. I've been on all sorts of podcasts, but our reach now is almost a billion actually. And the, the important component for us here is that what we've learned in this process is that when the unspeakable happens to you and you speak about it, it gives others permission to speak out too. And so we've taken this conversation outside of the house of medicine so that people can hear the, the needs both of the healthcare workforce and the healthcare workers themselves can be taking care of themselves and recognizing that they are not alone on this journey. One of our most important initiatives is to focus on a day of the year that existed before Lorna died, but a day of the year that I didn't even know as the CEO of the medical group that employed all the doctors at the University of Virginia in Charlottesville, Virginia, I didn't even know it existed 
National Physician Suicide Awareness Day. And we have scaled to hundreds of organizations, resources to support the workforce. We do, we do this because the rate of suicide of physicians and nurses, by the way, is twice that of the general population. It's higher for female nurses. And interestingly, U.S. physicians die by suicide at a higher rate than physicians in other countries. This is a unique problem to U.S. healthcare, and it must be addressed. Our campaign this year focused on National Physician Suicide Awareness Day is the Dear Future Doctor campaign, led by two notable physicians who have in the last year become increasingly visible with their personal challenges, Dr. Carrie Cunningham at Mass General and Dr. Christopher Veal, a third-year resident in, in Champaign, Illinois. Let's hear from Dr. Veal as he describes his vision for the future. My hope for physicians is that we are live in a place where we are allowed to be who we are unapologetically and that we are actually praised for it. Our vulnerabilities are our armor and that our profession is more than just a job. It is a way of healing. It's a way of giving life. Ask for help, you know, and I know that sounds very trivial, um, but it's very hard for medical students to ask for help. Um, I think it's probably the hardest part of med school, honestly, is asking for help because there's a little bit of shame and there's a little bit of embarrassment with seeming less than. It's okay to seem less than. You're a medical student. We assume you know nothing. But, you know, if you don't ask the questions, you will never know. And if you don't, you know, have the appreciation and self examination of how you are doing and what you need and speak up for it, you're never going to get it. And so that's my biggest recommendation for medical students and really anyone is channeling into that self-awareness and, and, and refueling that tank. Not being afraid of asking for help because the help is there and it's not embarrassing if you ask. No one's judging you. The only person that thinks about you as much as you is you. So that was our National Physician Suicide Awareness Day effort this past September. Recently, we've been working with the CDC in the United States on a number of very focused initiatives. The first emanates from this Vital Signs report, which they published in October of 2023, which identifies a healthcare worker mental health crisis. It, it, this, this report, which was just published October 24th, identifies that the number of health workers who have experienced harassment before the pandemic compared to post-pandemic has doubled. That nearly half health workers now are burned out, up from a third pre-pandemic. And that nearly half of health workers intended to look for a new job, up for a third pre-pandemic. The campaign that is launched related to this effort is called Impact Wellbeing. And it was developed by NIOSH, which is the occupational safety arm of CDC, in collaboration with our foundation to support hospital leaders in, and in turn their healthcare workforce to improve their professional well-being. The initial focus of impact well-being is in three discrete areas. And I want to focus your attention, though, right in the middle of the screen at that star, because one of the efforts that we've been um, really focused on for the last couple years has been to scale a toolkit that has three separate steps to it for organizations to remove these barriers to mental health access that uniquely apply to licensed healthcare workers and doing that both at the hospital level at the credentialing level as well as the state li state licensing level We've endeavored to really help change the landscape when it comes to advocacy at, at the federal level as well. In the summer of 2020, our United States Senator Tim Kaine came to us and asked if he could help us develop the first ever federal law focused on the well-being of healthcare workers. 
And on March 18, 2022, President Biden signed into law the Dr. Lorna Breen Healthcare Provider Protection Act, which provides over $140 million in new programs that are really focusing on improving the well being of our healthcare workers and preventing suicide. It also comes to fund this same national evidence based and education awareness campaign, Impact Well Being, that you just heard about two slides ago. The response to the law continues to fall in three major buckets. One, gratitude and appreciation for the work being done and helping to catalyze change for healthcare forever. The second is help with getting these mental health barriers out of our way. And the third is get rid of this administrative burden that's driving my burnout. So focusing for a moment more on these barriers, we know that when physicians continually are surveyed every year, they, they identify the fact that they do not get mental health treatment because of both the real stigma that they experience structurally when they have to answer these questions, as well as the, the stigma associated with what their peers would think about getting mental health treatment. So we've designed a three-part program to comprehensively address these issues. And it begins by awarding a badge, the Wellbeing First Champions Challenge Badge, to organizations that go through our process of auditing, changing, and communicating the changes to the workforce about their credentialing questions. One of the reasons we start with removing these barriers to mental health access is because the American Hospital Association in November of 2022 published its first ever suicide prevention guide. And in that identified three drivers of suicide. The first of which is this exact issue we're talking about, stigma associated with potentially losing your license or your hospital credentials. And so, as I said before, there are three steps to obtaining our badge. We are asking hospitals to audit all of their questions on their applications for license, uh, sorry, for credentials, both the initial and renewal, and these pesky peer reference forms that often have a bunch of hidden questions. The second is to change them using our best practices that we disseminate in our toolkit. And then finally, make sure the workforce knows the rules. They're entitled to know the rules in their local organization as well as their state. To show you how much progress we have made in just one year, focusing for a moment on Virginia. We've built a coalition across all the major healthcare associations in the state. We have developed a new law that applies to 500,000 licensed health workers of all types to remove questions that appear on licensing applications. In addition, we have now gotten 67% of the hospitals through the process of audit change and communicate in Virginia, such that we are now the leading state when it comes to the number of hospitals and the credit and the licensing that goes along with it. So Virginia has obtained this Champions Challenge badge, both at the state level for licensing and also at each one of these hospitals. To show you just visibly what the map looks like on medical licensing and how quickly progress has been made. In 2022, we published this map and it showed at that time, 19 states were initially awarded our badge. Those are the states in purple. In May, I, I uh, attended the annual meeting of the state licensing boards. And at that point, we had gotten to 21 states and I awarded the badge to the, all 21 states. And then something happened that I was not expecting. And that was, the teal states and the those purple states that have now filled in to make 26 purple states all came to us and said, we want that badge and we want to do this work now. What you'll see here is that by the end of the calendar year, we will be well into the majority of states on medical licensing. It's unbelievable that in one year's time, we could make this much progress. And I hope it gives you hope that progress and change is not only within reach, but it is absolutely happening right now. Unfortunately, it's not happening fast enough for nursing licensing. 
And just this past year, we issued uh, this report on nursing licensing. And you'll see that their purple states are much fewer than on, on the medical licensing front. We, and, and I will say, we're not even sure that all the purple states are deserving of a badge, which is why you won't see a badge on this, on this slide. That's because we couldn't get all the applications we need from even the purple states. So we're asking everyone's help here in reaching out to the nursing licensing board so we can go through the audit change communicate process with them and get this map completely purple. For your organizations who might be interested in joining our Champions Challenge today, you can use this QR code. It's at no cost to you to get access to all of these materials. We would love it if you would join us. And then finally, we would appreciate any support that you can offer our foundation. And don't forget, 988 is the lifeline for our healthcare workforce right now when they need it. And we know that it is working. So please, if you do nothing else from this talk, share that 988 number with your friends, your colleagues, and your family. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you for your partnership in this work. I look forward to hearing from you in the future.